Hi Booktube and welcome to a new video. This is uh, one part of a two video series on my non-fiction November. Uh, this first part is going to look at three of the four books I read against the non-fiction November prompts provided by Oliver the Book Olive. And then there'll be at least one if not two uh, videos of other non-fiction books I happen to read in November that weren't actually part of the non-fiction November prompt but um, I happen to read them in November. So um, the three books I'm going to talk about today against the prompts. The first is A Thousand Years of Nonlinear History by Manuel de Landa. And I chose the, this for the prompt Truth. It's basically a book at alternative history, as its title suggests. Uh, for design, we're going to talk about this book, Publishing Manifesto. It's a rather beautiful book about uh, publishing industry, both sort of commercial and um, sort of uh, countercultural with things like fanzines and things like that, uh, and also sort of how-tos and, and, and stuff. So uh, this was design. And finally, uh, for uh, voice, this book, William S. Burroughs and the Cult of Rock and Roll by Casey Ray. Uh, I assume from the title that this is looking at William Burroughs as the voice of several generations in the influence he had on rock musicians. And there he is, pictured with David Bowie. But I'm going to start with the uh, Thousand Years of Nonlinear History. So this looks at the period from 1000 uh, to, to, to the year 2000. And uh, it provides, or it looks to provide uh, an alternative way of conceiving about history. If you think about history as historians presenting this group of factors, this set of forces, and a causality that led to this set of events. So trying to describe the First World War, although ironically it's the one thing that historians find really hard to describe why it broke out, or colonialism, or um, the Industrial Revolution, or the French Revolution, you know, whatever it is, historians look back to, to find patterns, to find factors at play that build and conglomerate to cause the events. This book takes a totally different view. Uh, through uh, metaphors of geology, biology and linguistics. It says that uh, when you're considering things like uh, sort of structures that mankind has brought about, that it's not, it's not a linear thing, it's much more the sort of the play of forces and flows that uh, are always in a sort of tension with each other and sometimes you get hierarchies or, or, or what he calls strata, and other times you get meshes or networks, such as uh, population movements or the industrialization, with the labor force moving from agriculture into the cities to provide the labor, wars, revolutionary mobs, and now, of course, we have the internet, which is the most mesh network, completely uncontrolled, no one is in, 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 in control of that at all. Uh, economic markets would be another one, another example of mesh. And that these two are always in play, influence each other, constrict, constricting each other. Obviously, if a hierarchy, i.e. authoritarian control from the top, is very strong, very rigid, the room for manoeuvre for networks is, is quite restrictive. Whereas if networks sort of are outside of, of control largely, then that severely limits the, uh, the action uh, range for hierarchies. But it looks, as I say, it looks through these lenses of uh, geology, uh, biology and linguistics. And it sort of posits that everything is always in flow. And that when you see something like a rock or a mountain, that is almost a sort of a snapshot or accident hardening, mineralisation of the flow into a solid matter. Now, obviously, in the case of geology, it's deep, you know, it's a much deeper time. You know, so a mountain and rocks lasts for a considerable amount of time. But if you look at biology, he talks about DNA and mutation, both in terms of germs, viruses, bacteria, but also of, of food. That basically you have this biomass and it's constantly changing and mutating as you get species die out, new species mutate. Uh, and it's particularly interesting in how mankind um, sort of long before anyone had heard of Monsanto and, and, and genetically modified food, we were sort of doing it unknowing that's what we were doing. We were changing through our sort of breeding and crossbreeding and husbandry and all of that sort of thing. 
species of plants and of food plants in particular, we were manipulating the biomass. And sometimes this had terrible effect on the soil because we, you know, we didn't know the consequences of that. So that was quite interesting. Whereas I felt the one on sort of geology and lava flows was a, it got a bit too technical at times and, and lost me a bit. Um, you know, this is sort of as much as it's a book looking at history. It's also a book of sort of engineering and uh, of you know diagrams of force and flow. There's a lot of Gutierrez and Deleuze quote in there who I've never studied and have always confused me. The most interesting section is is the linguistics, where it's a really really good analysis of this constant play between centralization, norm, normalization of language into a standardized fixed thing, so that countries can expand, can conquer, can dominate, because everyone's literally really off the same hymn sheet. Versus the fact that languages are organic and there's always you know new words and new creoles and pigeons. That's the irony that the more successful a state comes on the back of, you know, uh, a standardised language, it expands to have influences and rub up against other cultures and other countries who then <laughs> influence the language and break down that homogeneity uh, of control. So it was really strong on, on, on the linguistic thing. And this book I found very stimulating. Uh, you know, I, I, it got me thinking. But as an overall thesis, I didn't really buy it. Because if you think about it, first of all, it's providing different patterns, different metaphors than conventional historians, but it's still providing patterns. You know, it's still trying to uh, define the underlying sort of structures of, of social things, such as the development of cities or how the industrialization come about. It's still looking for patterns. It's just giving alternative ones, in the, you know, through larval and energy flows or through you know, sort of the, the, the mutation of, of foodstuffs as we manipulate the biomass. But I just I just felt these are all very interesting, but they no more provide a, a sort of an overall view of history or a way into sort of explaining history than current theories that historians adopt, current metaphors they use, current schematics that they use, or even disgruntled ones like Marxist theory of history, you know, which provide a coherent overview, um, gets discredited, gets disproved. But what it's left with, and what I felt this book also ended up doing, was it provides a powerful critique of the existing status quo in history and thinking about history, but can't replace it. So, as with so many intellectual disciplines, some of the critiques of them are, are really, really powerful. But all that does is tear down the existing um, sort of consensus, or undermine it, or, or weaken it at least. But it's not strong enough in its own coherent body of thought to replace it uh, so that was the one weakness of the book really I'm not sure how anyone would go about thinking uh, and applying this to a study of all history there are very certain specific things so when he talks about cities capital cities he's really interested about their sort of how they're like parasites that sort of feed off the, you know the provinces particularly you know that these cities have to be supplied with food because they don't grow their own and the difference between cities that are port, capital cities that are ports like London and capital cities like Paris that weren't ports and how that influenced things. So in very sort of specific areas, it's really good. But as I, as I say, as an overall theory of history, it's really hard to apply. But, you know, I really like this book. I appreciated what it did for me in getting me thinking. So I gave this four and a half out of five. And on to Publishing Manifestos, which was my book for design. I bought this in an art bookshop and it is uh, a lot of manifestos about publishing, uh, self-publishing, independent writing, independent art. Uh, there's some political ones like a Riot Girl manifesto and lots of uh, homo core and queer manifestos. Uh, my favourite of the lot was an anti-colonial one from the 1920s from Brazil where it's talking about, uh, you know, sort of reclaiming sort of ancient primitive gods in order to sort of you know decondition Brazil from the, the effect of colonialism. And I'm just going to read a very quick snippet from that. We had justice, the codification of vengeance, science, the codification of magic, anthropophagy, the permanent transformation of the taboo into totem. Um, like any collection, 
uh, you know, there's good, bad and indifferent or, or not so much indifferent, but in this case, irrelevant to my sort of set of interests. There's a really inspiring one about um, this American independent publishers where they have nine hubs around the States where they have this machine where if you want to go and order one of their books, you go to the hub and they will print it up there and there for you. Um, it sounds a bit sort of, you know, sort of self-defeating. How can you ever sort of have any kind of distribution by that manner? But, you know, some of their books have sold 3,000 copies, which is more than respectable for literary fiction. And, and it creates a different culture because, you know, they hold parties and literary salons where the author will turn up and do readings and talk about the book in the hope that having taken along a machine to print it there and then people will buy the book at the salon and it will be made in front of their eyes for them. So, and he just said a lot of very interesting and inspiring things about the independent spirit and alternative ways of marketing and publishing. There is a lot about art in here. You know, there's a bit sort of raging debate about taking art from the galleries and making it widely available through print, through the photograph, you know, very artistic photograph books and, thing, and things like that. But there's also some sort of artists with how they use and see text. So, for example, we're all very familiar with the relationship of uh, the digital uh, online age of the internet and sort of printing whereby print has moved over uh lock stock and barrel onto you know ebooks and things like that but there's a there are artists who, who who work with it in the other way and the example here is there were two artists who exchanged emails with each other whereby each would email one line uh of uh, brett easton ellis's american psycho to the other uh, they would do it line by line, backwards and forwards, because they were interested in not only that performance art, but also what kind of got stuck to it, like limpets, in the sense of the advertising and, and the spam and stuff that, that surrounded the text. And they sort of published all of this. So it was, it was the original, it was the American Psycho text, line by line, broken down, you know, one per email. So all these hundreds of thousands of emails plus the second new text which was all the spam and the advertising that got attached to it now in the manifesto that, that mentioned that it said these are texts that are unreadable you know no one's going to sit down and pour through that and read it and get an entertainment in a way the art comes from the making comes from the performance of doing that act and sort of somehow redefining what we mean by text redefining the relationship of print and and, and uh, digital. So, you know, I just found things like that very interesting. So, as I say, you know, about 30% of, of, of the manifestos in here I find directly relevant and, and interesting. Uh, and in places, you know, as a writer, as an independent producer myself, you know, you go, yes, yeah, spot on. Um, and in others, it was like, yeah, this is irrelevant to me. So, you know, a beautiful looking book, I ought to say, you know. So one of the manifestos was done as a graphic sort of form, and this is Meta Comics presents Michael Bayer reads a statement regarding meta art. Uh, we get some poetry manifestos in the form of poems. That one. You Blew Up My House by Carl Hompfist, 2009. I would say all the manifestos are chronologically ordered. And interestingly, sort of 2018 onwards, the, the last few of this book, were completely uninvolving. <laughs> I'm not quite sure what that says. Um, image Reproduction Pricing Guideline for Artists, which I must admit I skipped over. I didn't drill down into the detail of that. This is America. You know, there are European and British examples, but it is very American focused. And the name of our publishing activity is, and this is by a group of feminist publishers called And Publishing. That's what it looks like. So, you know, a beautiful book with some decent content. Um... Uh, one publishes to find comrades, uh, Eva Weinmeier. That was a quote from... Oh, somebody said that. Uh, oh, I can't remember. But, you know, they were sort of uh, 
you know, they designed sort of alternative posters and, and things and were quite, you know, to get their message across and do it quite effectively through humour. So, you know, all in all, a worthwhile read, you know, it's something I could read in small chunks, you know, three or four manifestos here and there. Uh, so, yeah, so I gave this four stars. And on to this book, William S. Burroughs and the Cult of Rock and Roll by Casey Ray. And what a disappointing read this was. So I assume from the title and the blurb that this, this was a book about Burroughs' sort of impact and spell woven over rock and roll from the 60s, even through till now, but, you know, particularly up to the time of his death. Because we know that he hung out with a lot of musicians. A lot of musicians made pilgrimage to go and visit him in his windowless bunker in New York City, which was in the Bowery just over the road from CBGB's. And sometimes he'd go and see friends like Patti Smith or Blondie perform there. Um, so he's absolutely surrounded by the world of rock and roll. But there's no thesis in this book. And there's no real arguments. What we get is a lot of repetition, a lot of assertion. So, you know, in the first early chapters, it talks about how members of Sonic Youth, you know, went to meet Burroughs and stuff. And then it will repeat, repeat it, you know, three chapters later when it's actually looking at Sonic Youth's relationship with Burroughs. So it's just, it seems to be the argument by assertion over and over and over again that Burroughs met these people. Therefore, Burroughs was influential on them. So the first chapter is Kurt Cobain. Now, Kurt Cobain met William Burroughs once. And interestingly, Burroughs was perspicacious enough to say that man is a troubled soul uh, because it was shortly before uh, Cobain committed suicide. When he met David Bowie, again, seemingly only once, and he says, oh, that man Bowie is, is very ambitious. He knows exactly what he wants and, and where he wants to go. So Burroughs is, is smart enough to sum these people up in, in you know, one go. Sort of like Joe Strummer of The Clash. You know, when Burroughs was in the bunker in New York, Cl The Clash had relocated to America. And, and Strummer was a regular member of dinner parties at Burroughs. But we get nothing, you know, we never have any words from out of Strummer's mouth as to what, you know, what he was doing there, why he liked Burroughs, did he have any influence on his music. He's just, he's just a, a name on a table plate, you know, a, a placemat or whatever. Um... I would say that there are th there are two or three musicians where there is a genuine argument for influence. Uh, the first is uh, Robert Page of Led Zeppelin. Uh, Burroughs went to a Led Zeppelin concert and reviewed it for some some publication which I now can't can't remem rem remember. And what they had in common was an interest in the occult and in magic. Uh, Robert Plant bought um, Alistair Crowley's uh, sprawling mansion up in in Scotland near Loch Ness. Um, so there was a genuine connection there. The second is uh, the band Devo, who were sort of uh, sort of punk pranksters, uh, where the only bit we get in here is a a uh, a bit from a, an interview where they were they were talking to each other, Devo and, and Burroughs. And all that made me want to do was to go and track down the original article in Trouser Press and read it because I would have got more out of that than whatever it was supposed to be doing in here. And then the other the other group that I would say Burroughs had a genuine connection with was was um, Genesis P. Orridge's sort of art uh, performance art stroke music uh, band. First of all, Throbbing Gristle, and then Psychic TV, because they were genuinely interested in pursuing the same effects of um, sort of through sound uh, and sort of mixing. And, and remixing sounds of everyday life with sort of things like, you know, sort of totalitarianism of crowds and music and all that sort of thing, of, of, of reversing mind control, which is very much what Burroughs was interested in. So I would say those three genuinely had a connection, had an interaction, swapped ideas. You know, there was a cross-pollination or how much Burroughs actually took from the musicians, you know, I think is, is a moot point. But apart from those three, the fact that he knew Patti Smith, Laurie Anderson, Lou Reed, Sonic Youth, um, The Clash, uh, Bob Dylan, you know, they are all unconvincingly portrayed here. And I just, you know, I've got a few examples of, of what I mean. So, The Grateful Dead, Jerry Garcia and another band member went to meet Burroughs. Uh, and the, the other band member, who I can't remember his name, is reporting this. Um... Burroughs in a pork pie hat and raincoat looking like a ghost is checking out as we arrive. 
He says the hotel is not seedy enough for him. It makes him nervous. I introduce them, although they've met many times before. Burroughs doesn't have a great memory for rock stars. Well, there you go. Mr Burroughs, do you remember Jerry Garcia from The Grateful Dead? I've always liked the name of your band, said Burroughs. He repeats the words, The Grateful Dead, solemnly. Wonderful occult ring to that. Never heard your music, though. Jerry offers him a tape, which he politely pockets. But you know he'll never play. In his esotero-pedantic, eso strange Midwestern way, Burroughs wants to know, does the name come from the old folk tale or is it from the Egyptian ship of the sun? So, you know, I don't think Burroughs is that interested in, in music and rock and roll. Um, he, I think he, he appreciates that... He, I think what they have in common is they are both outsiders, they are both provocateurs on society, but Burroughs is far more intellectually rigorous in his pursuit of, of you know, using the occult, using the cut-up, uh, method to reveal, you know, the control, the mind control of, you know, that we have basically sold ourselves in order to conform to what we understand as reality. And Burroughs is always chipping away at that reality with all these quite experimental and radical techniques, such as the cut up, such as what he did with his recordings, things like that. And some of the musicians in here you know, do claim that they've written songs using the cut-up method where, you know, they literally scissor, you know, they've, they've got block, they've got all these words and sentences but it's not coming together, so they cut them up, put them in a hat, draw them out. Several of them claim to have done that. But not every one of their songs is written like that. You know, you talk about the odd song here and there. Equally for Burroughs, I think, while he could recognise the, the sort of the, the, the trance-like cultic power that could overtake an audience at a Led Zepp concert... He's equally aware that once musicians get to a certain level where they're playing 30,000 you know, 30, people stadia, uh, their merchandise stalls and all of that, that they become an agent for control, not an agent against control. Um, so I think Burroughs actually had a very limited um, respect for musicians in that, yes, they were outsiders. Yes, some of them travelled similar paths to him but they were always capable of, of, of sort of selling out or at least getting knocked off the journey. They were not as intellectually rigorous as he was. Um, it was a mixture of, I think, his loneliness, but also his sort of, you know, he was in, had impeccable manners, William Burroughs, which is very strange when you think about how nasty some of his writing was. And he wouldn't turn these people away. He would greet them, you know, he would, he would be the, the consummate host. And he would listen politely to what they'd say. And he'd try and draw out what was of interest to him, which was not necessarily at the core of musicians. So there was that. Well, this book does make a couple of good points, which is why I gave it 2.5 stars rather than 2. Um, so this is Philip Glass talking about, about Burroughs. Philip Glass called Burroughs the most important writer of our day, whose work helped set him on his own creative course. But that, you know, that statement is made so many times, but it's never really gone into deeply. Um, 20 years ago, the crucial events of my life were coming across his work and John Cage's work, he said. They were both completely new and completely American, with no connection to European tradition. Burroughs really created a new American artistic tradition. And I think that is an absolutely valid point. I think, you know, and Cage as well in music. I, I think I, th I think that was one one good point. Uh, and then, as an example of this book, I just, I just want to see if you agree with me here. Um, so this is Genesis P. Orridge of uh, Psychic TV, who, as I say, is one of the few genuinely connected people to Burroughs that, that I felt from this book. Porridge explained the group's aesthetic in a 1983 interview that echoes Burroughs' remarks about perceptual reality resembling cut-ups. I don't like using the word real, but in a sense we are trying to make everything more real and to portray the same way that a cut-up theoretically does. What it's like to be in a house and go along the street and have a car go past or a train and work in a factory or walk past a factory. Just a kind of industrial life or a suburban, uh, suburban urban industrial life. So that's what Porridge is saying and that's what a lot of their music was. It was, as I say, the mixture of the sort of the mundane sounds, the more occult, uh, you know, and they would bring these things together. But I don't think that proves the setup argument where, as I just reading it back again, that echoes Burroughs' remarks about perceptual reality resembling cut-ups. 
It doesn't because or Porridge is saying that they're using cut-ups in music to portray reality in its, all its humdrumness. Um, you know, just a kind of industrial life or a suburban urban industrial life. So I think actually that example that he gives doesn't clinch his argument, it undermines it. Um, so I wasn't, I'm, you know, I really not, and also, you know, in a group's aesthetic that echoes Burroughs' remarks. So we get a lot of these echoing, a lot of, pro, you know, Burroughs' band philosophy, Proxima abutting each other, but it doesn't prove anything. It's like um, synchronicity. They have, they appear to be saying the same thing, but one does not prove a connection with the other. Um, and finally, so listen up, Sean, uh, the book maniac. You're a big fan of Denton Welsh, and I know you hate William Burroughs. Just want to read this to you. I prefer cats to people, Burroughs said. Most people aren't cute at all, and if they are cute, they rapidly outgrow it. We're not tending to his furry menagerie, Burroughs made good progress with The Place of Dead Roads, a book greatly influenced by British author Denton Welch, whose fastidiously observant prose Burroughs had long admired. So there you go, Sean. There is a Denton Welch fan. Um, <laughs> in William Burroughs, I bet you never knew that. And then finally, I think this annoyed me more than anything. Uh... He says in here, so Ian Curtis of Joy Division uh, was on the same bill of Plan B in Belgium as Burroughs. And he actually says, you know, no one's quite sure on the, on the real version of events. Well, if you read Peter Hook, who was the basis in Joy Division, if you read his book, which came out before this book, uh, so there's no reason why he couldn't have done his research, Hook, said, Hook gives a version. Now, I can't say definitively that it's true, but it's got much more detail than the, the sort of apocryphal tales about this incident offered in here. Where, uh, Hook, you know, Ian Curtis was, a, was a, a Burroughs fan. He'd read a couple of his books. And he went up to Burroughs and sort of says, can you give me a copy of Wild Boys and sign it, please? And Hook goes, the reason that Curtis asked him for that is because Curtis didn't have any money because the band were, you know, just, just at the beginning of their careers. And Burroughs sent him away with a flea in his ear and said, buy the book and then I'll sign it. And Hook, you know, pissed himself laughing at it. You know, we don't get that version at all in here, which I think is slack. And I think it also shows Burroughs up to, you know, yes, Burroughs sort of, you know, was a bit sniffy about rock and roll and it reaches a certain level of fame and, and you know, you get the merchandise sales and you get 30,000 people in an arena. Well, here's Burroughs doing a similar you know, here's a fan, a poor musician who we could tell by the, the clothes that he wore. But, you know, no, pay me the ten bucks for my book, you know. So Burroughs also had that side about, you know, fame and what he was worth. As any artist, any self-respecting artist, has a sense of what they're, they're worth. And that's, you know, unfortunately, in the system we live in, that is always priced in money. And in that whole section, you know, they, he was describing how Joy Division came from Manchester, which he described in the 1970s as Dismal Manchester. Well, that may be correct, but let's face it, New York in the 70s was a dismal place. And the whole point about both places is fantastic art came out of the terrible living conditions and social conditions of those places. So just to dismiss it as Dismal Manchester without putting it in context, the context of New York being the same, the context of the art that came out of here, Again, I think it's just poor writing. So this book is completely unilluminating, which is a shame because it's a beautiful book. Not only the cover, but it's just it's just something about this book. This is an artifact. This is a work, you know, this is a beautiful book to, to hold, but there's so little of worth in it. No thesis, no convincing arguments, even without a sort of thesis to tie it all together. Uh, about, you know, three out of the 20 rock and rollers mentioned in here had a genuine intellectual and artistic connection with Burroughs. The rest were just playing at it or paying homage to, you know, this great cultural figure who was at the centre of a lot of what they did because Burroughs was on bills, performance bills, with lots of musicians and lots of Burroughs' work was set to music by musicians. I'm not saying there's no connection. I'm not saying he didn't sort of have an influence, but it's not as overt as the title of this book. And I think... The the you know, not that there is a thesis, but the thesis that the author would have liked to advance. So really disappointing, 2.5 stars.